Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. Well, we're going to continue our core value series today. Uh, it's been really good up to this point. It's been really good, been really insightful, been awesome. <clears throat> I'm glad April likes it. Um, <laughs> you'd think people were missing today. You wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> um, no, it's been really good up to this point, and I think it's only going to continue to get better. But today we're going to be talking about generosity. That is one of our core values. Ironically, we just got accused on Facebook for not being generous, <clears throat> and YouTube also. Uh, yeah, someone, someone commented something and said we, we were stingy or something like that. And I was like, I've never even, I don't know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway... Um, I will say generosity being a core value of ours, we really do, anytime we have the opportunity and we're able to, we give. We try to as, as often as we can. We don't have much, but what we do have and what we're able to give, we do. And it doesn't mean that we're like a handout service or anything like that, but I mean, we are... I'm not saying we, we have perfected generosity, but our generosity goes to the level of one day we had a couple come to our church. <clears throat> it was fairly recently. And, you know, you've, you've heard the same story from people like this sometimes where they're like, you know, I came from this location, ran out of gas, and I need a car, I need money to fill up my gas tank, you know, whatever, okay? Can't feed my kids. Um, they came here and they were asking for money. And in my mind, I knew they were lying to me. But in my heart, I was told to give. This is, this is not, and I didn't give out of my pocket, we gave from the church. All right. <clears throat> um, after I gave them this very small gift, he was not appreciative of it because it wasn't enough. And to be honest, I was, I was pretty mad. I was, I was pretty angry. I was. Because I was just like, okay, you're probably lying to me. I just gave you money. It wasn't enough, but I gave you money, and you, you're not thankful for it. I mean, it was literally to the point he grumbled and sighed and walked off. And that was it. Did I regret giving to him? Not at all. What is he going to go do with the money? I don't care. Generosity is not about what the person does or the, the soil does that you sow into. It's about the fact you sow. What are you doing with the seed? Are you being obedient with the seed? Are you being obedient with what God's telling you to give? It's not just about, well, I, I don't want to give to that person because they may misuse it. We misuse riches all the time. All right, we can't accuse anybody else of that. So we got to keep ourselves in check there. It comes down to, we do try to, every opportunity that we have, give. And we have, we have so many amazing people in this house who are just constantly giving and constantly willing and ready to give and ready to share. And it's amazing, not just materialistically, but also spiritually. We, we belong to a really great body. We really do. We have really good people here. And <clears throat> the times in the past we've ever needed to, to raise funds for things, it's happened. And, and it's like, we're, we're not like the biggest church, but we're taken care of, and it's amazing. So thank you for always being ready to do that, always being in a position to be generous and to share, because that's a core value of who we are. And, 
In order for it to be a core value of who we are, it has to be who we are, right? So thank you. Well, I want to read our core value today. It should be in your bulletin if you have one. You can read it with me. But it's generosity. And it goes like this. We train our minds to think like Jesus. In that, everything we receive from God, both natural and spiritual, is meant to be given to those around us. We work and pray for the prosperity of our city. That part taken from Jeremiah 29, we work and pray for the prosperity of our city, that we can't expect our city to prosper if all we're doing is praying for it. There's a certain amount of work involved. And I would love, I would love for us to be involved somehow, physically involved in the prosperity of our city but we all have to be on board for that to happen. It's not going to be uh, something that I come up with or something that I do. We all have to be involved in this, and we all have to be willing to do our part. So I want to talk about generosity today, and everything that I'm going to say is going to come from a position of this is who we should be, but it doesn't mean that this is who we aren't. Because I, like I said, I do believe that we are a very generous church. I believe that. So I, I won't want you to take anything that I say today personally. This is not about us. This is just about who we are to continue to be, all right? I'm not saying we're not doing this right. I'm saying this is who we need to continue to be. Are you with me? All right, turn with me to Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5. And we're going to start by just talking about very briefly, the kingdom of God principle of generosity, the principle of kingdom generosity, what it's supposed to look like, what generosity means in the kingdom of God. So Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This verse is a perfect illustration of the generosity of God. What it shows us is that God did not wait to receive something before he gave something. Because it says that he died for us while we were sinners. In fact, in the Garden of Eden, we squandered, we squandered everything that he gave us. And he wasn't waiting around for, for us to become worthy of him before he decided to make us worthy. He didn't decide, he didn't wait around for us to become worthy of the gift of Jesus. He just gave Jesus, he gave himself, and it was at a time when he was not getting anything from us. If anything, we were running from him. So he didn't base what he gave on what he received. He gave, and now everything that he receives is based on what he gave. Isn't that awesome? God gave first, and now he receives so much from us. will never be enough, but it is. I mean, we give him worship like this this morning. We do that on a regular basis. That's, that blesses him, but he receives all this, and it's not based on us. It's based on what he gave to us, right? So it's uncharacteristic of God to base what he gives on what he receives. So it should be uncharacteristic of us to base what we give on what we receive. My wife heard that one. It's uncharacteristic of God to base what he gives on what he receives, so it should be uncharacteristic of us to base what we give on what we receive. We don't base generosity on blessing. We base generosity on obedience, period. Well, I don't have enough to give. Who said that, you or God? So we base generosity on God's leadership, on obedience. It's not based on whether I have enough because that's, that's pretty subjective. And the only person's point of view we should care about is God's, <clears throat> right? 
All right, so now we've gotten the principle of generosity, the principle of kingdom generosity is this. Generosity is not based on blessing, period. It's not based on blessing, it's based on obedience. And it often requires sacrifice, often. All right, now I wanna talk about materialistic generosity. We're gonna go over this quite a bit, um, and then we're gonna transition into spiritual generosity briefly. I'm gonna cover materialistic generosity a little more, and I have a reason for this. When I say materialistic generosity, I don't just mean generosity um, in the way of giving money. I mean anything material, all right? Anything material. Here's some facts. Nearly 25% of Jesus' teaching in the Gospels, nearly 25%, that's a quarter, (laughs) that's a lot, Nearly 25% of Jesus' teachings are about money and possessions. 25%. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a big portion of his teachings to be about money, about the righteous stewardship of money and possessions. One out of 10 verses in the Gospels deal with money. 10% of the verses in the Gospels deal with money. There are more than 2,000 scriptures on tithing, money, and possessions in the Bible. 2,000, more than 2,000 scriptures on money, tithing, and possessions in the Bible. That is twice the amount of scriptures on faith and prayer combined. 2,000 scriptures on money, tithing, and possessions. That is twice the amount of scriptures that are in here on faith and prayer combined. Now, that doesn't mean that our spiritual life revolves around money and possessions and what we do with it. I think the reason it's in here so much is because God knows we're going to struggle with it. God knows we're going to have trouble with money and possessions. How many of us in here struggle with money and possessions? Uh, Three people, four people, okay. That's what I'm trying to get here. (laughs) Every hand should be raised. We all deal with that. We all deal with that. We're faced with it every day. I mean, we're approaching tax day. And if you haven't done your taxes debt yet, what are you thinking about? Money. <laughs> am I going to have to pay or am I going to have to get that H&R Block refund, you know? Like, like we're just thinking about, we're thinking a lot about money. Every time you drive by a gas station, you see the sign, you're thinking about money. Every time you go to the store and you end up, like my wife and I, we go to the store to spend $40 and we end up spending 100 It's like we just... <laughs> You're just like, well, I do need that, and we do need that while we're here. We might as well get it, you know? It's like we're just surrounded by money. It's everywhere. Do I have enough? Not just money either. Do I have enough? Do we have enough food? Do we have enough gas? Is our house big enough? Is it small enough? You know, whatever it may be, it's just so much based on our possessions, and that's why I feel like God intentionally put it in his word this much because this is a huge deal. Jesus brought this up so much, not because he needed money. He's not trying to like guilt people into giving him money because he's like this nomad and doesn't have anything. He's not trying to guilt people. He didn't bring this up this much because he needed money. He brought this up this much because he knows how easy it is to be possessed by possessions. He knows how easy it is to be controlled by money. So he hit this over and over and over. We talked about the the rich young ruler recently and his unwillingness to give up his possessions. And according to Jesus, I mean, he says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus eventually says, all right, you got one last thing to do. Give up your possessions. Well, of course, that was to him specifically. It's not that all of us are supposed to just abandon all the stuff that we have. 
But what Jesus noticed in this man was he was possessed by everything he owned. And if you're unwilling to give up what possesses you, then God can't possess you. Right? All right. Now let's turn to 1 Timothy 6. First Timothy 6, and I want to read verses 17 through 19. This is Paul's letter to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy. And in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, he says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. How many of us in here feel like this applies to us? He says, instruct those who are rich. Do you feel rich? Do you feel spiritually rich? Do you feel materialistically rich? That's good. That's good. But the main issue here, the main issue we encounter here is the word rich. It's a big issue with this word because it's very subjective. It's like what's rich to you may not be what is rich to me, right? But because of this, we have to figure out what God means by rich Otherwise, we'll find ourselves in a position that's like, well, I think $10 million is rich. Wouldn't you say $10 million is rich? Okay, well, I only have nine. (laughs) See, we have to figure out, I don't have $9 million. (laughs) I really don't. (laughs) Take the million out, and that's about what I have. (laughs) No. But we have, to, we have to be able to discern what, what God means by rich. Why has he intentionally put this in the word? We want to figure out what he means by it because otherwise we'll find ourselves in that position of not really knowing and being able to decide for ourselves what rich is, what it means. But if, if we decide for ourselves, it's going to look different for everybody. So the word rich here, whenever in verse 17 he says, instruct those who are rich. The word rich means literally abounding in material resources. Abounding in material resources. Now before this, contextually, Paul was talking about ministers who misuse their position for financial gain. But if you read here, it doesn't say that. It says instruct those who are rich. Instruct those who are rich. The word rich means abounding in material resources. Now, if we want to, we can decide, well, what does it mean to abound? That's subjective too. Sometimes I feel like I'm abounding, sometimes I don't. <laughs> right? But to put it simply, to abound means to have more than enough. Just bring it down to the simplest level there. Abounding in material resources means I have more than enough material resources. More than enough. It doesn't just mean money. It means everything. How many of you are abounding in something? Yeah. Okay. In that, you are rich. Technically, according to this. In that, I am rich. Now look here, he says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. In other words, the uncertainty of whether you will abound in those things. Don't fix your hope on that. But on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. That's cool. I like that. He richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. 
Okay, not for one second can you leave today and think that I told us that we can't enjoy what God has given us because I just read it. God richly supplies us with all things for our enjoyment. Not only though, not only for our enjoyment. Because right after this, in verse 18, he says, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. The good works that he's talking about here is generosity. To be rich in generosity, not rich in wealth. To be rich in generosity, not rich in material possessions. You hear me? Instruct them, you gotta enjoy your stuff, but remember, your wealth is ultimately, in God's eyes, your wealth, our wealth is not tied to what we own. Our wealth is tied to what we give. Be rich in generosity. God sees that as wealth in the kingdom. Generosity is kingdom wealth. We've, we talk all the time about how upside down the kingdom is. You want to know how the kingdom works? Look at how the wor world works and flip it over. Wealth in the kingdom is generosity. Wealth in the world is, I need more. Wealth in the kingdom is, I'm going to give more. God sees it that way. And there, there's, it's like there's a lot of different layers to it. It's not just a magic trick. It's like if I give, then I'm just rich. All right? There's, there's a lot of different layers to it that we're going to unpack here. But material, material abundance is meant to be given, not maintained. Amen? Now look at this. He says, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. <laughs> now he's talking about a savings account. But it's a savings account that's full of nothing. It's a savings account that's full of generosity. Storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. Paul says here that generosity must be a part of our foundation. It is what we build on. It's not what we strive for. It's what we build on. It has to be, this is where we start. And it makes sense because salvation started with generosity. Salvation happened because of generosity. The root of eternal life of our salvation is generosity. So it is a part of our foundation. If Jesus is your foundation, which he should, then your foundation is generosity because Jesus was a gift and a free one. So this is what we build on. This is not what we build. This is what we build on. It's not something we should be trying to do, trying really hard to do. It just should be the, just the basics of who we are. This is just who we are. And everything that we build and do comes out of that right there. Storing up for themselves a foundation for the future, a good foundation for the future. And then he says, so that, everybody say, so that so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Instruct them to be generous so that they can take hold of life. Now, when he says life indeed, this means true life. What do you think that is? Eternal life. Life indeed, true life, eternal life. This is interesting because Paul's saying if you want to take hold of eternal life, you need to be generous. Now, I know 
Some people probably get a bad taste in their mouth with this. Because it's like, are you telling me that I have to earn my way into heaven by being generous? Because Paul says, take hold of eternal life by being generous. Take hold of eternal life by being generous. I believe this is not about doing good works so that we can get to heaven. This deals with desires that may keep us from it. You cannot be a generous person and have a, desire, a covetous desire for money that is greater than your desire for God. Paul's saying you want to prevent yourself be, from becoming a greedy, covetous person of avarice. Be generous. Then you can truly take hold of eternal life. You can take hold of eternal life. It, it, the, the love of money, it says six verses, seven, eight verses before this. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. <laughs> all kinds of evil. You know that. Look at the world. A lot of the evil is tied to what? Money. A lot of it is. A lot of evil in the world is tied to money. It's, the, it's not money. It's the love of money. Being generous will keep you from that. Being generous will keep me from loving money, from putting it in a God position in my life. Being generous with my possessions will free me from being possessed by them. And this is ultimately how, what, what Paul is saying here, how we lay hold of that eternal life, true life. It's going to help. You hear me with that? All right, now let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter nine, and I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. It says, "Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us." is producing thanksgiving to God. He says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. We've talked about this before, but seed is for sowing and bread is for food. Seed is for sowing and bread is for food. In other words, in what God gives us, we have to be able to discern, is this seed or is this bread? Are you here? God gives us a lot of stuff, does he not? Man, he takes care of us. He supplies every need. He provides for us. But we need to be able to discern, is what God just gave me here seed or is it bread? In other words, is this meant to be eaten and consumed or is it meant to be sown and given? Seed is for sowing. Bread is for food. I'm saying this because sometimes we eat our seed. But God can't multiply a seed when it's consumed. He can multiply seeds when they are sown because what are they going to do? They're going to grow something in its place. How do seeds multiply? They multiply by being sown and growing and the harvest being reaped. <laughs> right? God can't multiply my seed if I consume it. So if, if God is, is giving me something, I need to make sure, I need to ask him, God, are you giving me this so that I can give it? Or are you giving me this so that I can eat it? Are you taking care of me or are you wanting to, me to take care of other people? Right? I think, I think it's crazy that 
the chances of there being believers in the world that would go to like a fancy restaurant and spend $200 on a meal would be stingy with like a few dollars, you know, towards somebody else. Or even in the tithe. I, I, can't, I can't wrap my mind around that. Even when it comes to tipping servers, if, if, I, if I showed Bailey what I tip servers, she might not be, I'm just joking, she would love it. She, she, she honestly would. But I, maybe it's because I was a server once and I understand it, but I always tip way more than I should. Even, even when it's like, <laughs> Linda knows firsthand, <laughs> I always tip way more than I should, even when it's like the service was bad, the person was rude or not helpful or whatever. I still am like, eh, why not? I'm abounding in material resources here. Why am I going to take this home and hold on to it? And you're like, well, you, you don't get to share the gospel with them. Oh, I, I just did. Did I not? <laughs> I mean, whenever I was a server, the Sunday church crowd, was the, they were the worst tippers. And you know, they, they just went to church because they come in dressed in their suit and ties, you know, and everything. And, and it's like the best tip I ever got was from this foul-mouthed guy that sat in the corner, drink, he drank like six, six beers, you know, the whole time he was there. It was like my first table by myself. I worked at Garfield's that is now Bricktown Brewery. I worked at Garfield's as my first table by myself, and the owner of the restaurant was there. And I mean, I got everything wrong. I did nothing right, nothing at all. And this guy gives me a $100 tip. I mean, I deserved it because <laughs> the first table they gave me was an eight top, and I'm going, I can't serve eight people, my first table by myself, but I, I did it. I did the best I can. I got a $100 tip, and the owner chewed me out. And you know how badly I wanted to pull out that $100 bill and just be like, I quit. No. <laughs> no, but like, honestly, if, if somebody goes into a restaurant, if you're going to, if you're look, if you look like you just came from church, you better tip like a Christian. I'm just saying, you better tip like a believer. You, you, you have an example to set. And you are an image bearer of somebody other than yourself. We have to be those kind of people. It shows. It shows. Man, how did I... <laughs> We can't, we can't eat our seed. Is this, is this meant to be given? Is it meant to be kept? And I, I can't tell you, there have been many times in my life I have chosen not to consume or to spend something because I felt like I wasn't supposed to and God had other plans for it later on. It's something that we, that we have to be aware of in the moment. And we have to be attentive to his voice with everything that he provides. If I am not my, my own, then everything I own is not my own. Even if I did work a 40-hour work week to obtain it, it still belongs to him. Amen? So we can't expect God to multiply seed that we consume. But I love this. It says in verse 11, you will be enriched in everything for all liberality. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality. I love the way the ESV puts it. The ESV says, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. You will be enriched in every way. Why? So you can go out and have a shopping spree, not saying anything against shopping sprees. <laughs> You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every way. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. This right here tells us the purpose, the, the, ultimately the purpose of what God provides for us. It's not just to take care of us. 
but so that we can have opportunities to give and to be generous. Amen? Now, I want to get this out of the way. I don't believe God is a socialist. I don't believe God expects the rich to work so that the poor can get benefit from that. I don't believe that. I'm sorry, that is not scriptural. It's not. All right? As long as the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat, I will believe that. And it still says it. <laughs> Hasn't been erased by the Democratic Party yet. All right? I'm just trying to be funny. <laughs> I don't believe the rich are meant to work so that the poor don't have to. I don't believe that. I believe that everybody should work, including women. I believe that. I think that's the most feminist thing about me, is that I believe women should work. I don't believe God put Adam and Eve in the garden and expected Adam to do all the work while Eve stood, so they're looking naked and pretty, okay? I don't believe that. I believe God put Adam and Eve in the garden for both of them to work. Now, that being said, if somebody, if, if the woman doesn't work, it's not going to be like, you need to make your woman work, you know, or something like that. At the same time, I have, seen, I have seen couples that it's like the husband's working, doing everything that he can to, like, make this family succeed, and the wife just refuses to get a job. And I'm like, man, if you would just get a job, <laughs> it might help, you know? You're hearing too much about me right now. <laughs> but that being said, you know, I feel like men and women should work. Men, if you're not working, then you and I need to have a talk. I'm like, that, that's a huge, huge pet peeve for me. And I think it is for God, honestly. I think that he doesn't like that. I think that he, he has a problem with that. Um, if, if your wife is the only one producing, you need to get off your booty. Men, it's like a lot of women in here. Thank you. <laughs> You need to get off your booty and do some work. I mean, the longer you sit on that thing, the softer it gets. <laughs> Just makes it easier to keep sitting, <laughs> right? All right, that's it. Let's tur turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All that to say God's not a socialist. First Corinthians 12. I want to read verses 4 through 11. We're just about done. We're going to move on to spiritual generosity just briefly. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Everyone say common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. This says in verse 7, to each one is given the manifest, each one, not each church, each person, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the what? The common good. The manifestation of the Spirit, this means evidence of the Spirit in me. God has given me a gift as evidence of Him in me. Anytime I operate in a gift of the Spirit, it reveals Him to those around me. But it says that, he, that these gifts were given to us for the common good. You don't have to turn there, but 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each one has received a special gift, Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Employ it in serving one another. The gifts of the Spirit were not given to the church so the church could get rich. The gifts of the Spirit were given to the church so that believers could prosper in the Spirit. 
so that you and I could grow and benefit from the blessings of God. He gave this, the gift of prophecy to the church, not so I could form an organization that, and, and get on TV and put a number at the bottom of the screen so you could give me money. God gave the gift of the prophetic to the church to build up the church and not to put a price on it, but to build up the church for free. I'm gonna give you this gift for free because guess what? I didn't pay for it, right? He gave these gifts to the church for the common good. Spiritual generosity looks like this. Every single person in here has received at least one thing. You know what you've received? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> you've received the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have access to the gifts of the Spirit. If you have access to the gifts of the Spirit, you're responsible for stewarding the gifts of the Spirit and distributing them to those around you. If the Lord gives you a word for somebody, give it to them, because if you don't, you are not only robbing God, but you're robbing that person. Whatever God gives me designed for someone else belongs to them, not to me, right? I'm perfectly fine with writing songs that only stay in here. I didn't used to be. I used to think they need to, they need to go to the nations. I'm perfectly fine with writing songs that stay in here because I'm still distributing them to the body of Christ. The same way, the same thing, the same pr perspective should be. If God gives you a word of knowledge, if he gives you a prayer, if he gives you extra time, if he gives you extra time and he says that time belongs to that person, don't keep it for yourself, yeah. right? If, the, if he gives you extra energy, if he puts someone on your mind, I try to, I try to as often as I can, as soon as someone crosses my mind, I at least send them a text message. I don't even know what I'm gonna talk about, but you crossed my mind, so I wanted to let you know. Like, whatever God gives us is meant for everyone else. It is meant to benefit the body, not just myself. Amen? <clears throat> and this is the other thing. If God has given each of us something to benefit the body, how do we give it to them if we're never around? How do we give the church what God has given to us to give the church if we're never with the church. Community plays into, into this. That what do we come here for? We don't come here to be entertained, even though I guarantee you if we had the best entertainment ever, we'd have a packed house. But we don't come here to be entertained. We come here to bless the Lord and bless each other. That's why we gather. If I don't do that, and I'm not just talking about this, I mean even outside of this, if we're not around each other, how are we to bless each other? How are we to do that? If I just stick to myself, you know, and do my own thing, how can I bless the body of Christ with what God has put in me? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm like really hitting the nail in a little further, I think, than it needs to go. But this is, this is so important. Community groups are valuable times because there may be someone in those groups that's really struggling and God gave you what they need. But if you're not there, you can't give that to them. <laughs> Am I lying? Well, I can call them later. You might miss it. Like we have to be together because God puts things in us that are meant to be shared. They're meant to be shared. They're meant to, to they're put in me to bless other people. Amen? All right, one last thing. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 10. Thank you for being generous with your amens. <laughs> Matthew chapter 10, and I want to read verses 5 through 8, and I'll make a quick point, and then we'll be done. 
Starting with verse 5 in chapter 10. These 12, the disciples, Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. People say Jesus was the only one that could raise the dead. Then you're calling him psychotic because he just told his disciples to do that. But then he says, freely you received, freely give. The interesting thing about this is from what we can read, none of them had experienced what Jesus told them to go and do. None personally. None of them had been personally raised from the dead. Maybe they were healed, I don't know, but we don't read about it. None of them were lepers that were cleansed. None of them were once demonized and got the demons cast out of them. But Jesus says, freely you receive, freely give, freely give. So he's not specifically just saying, go and do these things. He's saying, if you receive something for free, give it away. <laughs> Whatever you got for free, go and give it away for free. Don't hold on to it. It's a broad statement. It's a broad statement, not just saying these are your only duties, heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. He's saying, if, you have, if you've received something for free from me or from the Lord, it's time to just go and give it away. Freely you receive, freely give. And he's also telling them not to charge people for it <laughs> because it was pretty common in that day to do that. But we, not just not charging people for it in the, in the, the form of, money, but we shouldn't charge people for it in the form of trust either. Well, I don't know you, so you're not worth this. We don't have a relationship, so I'm not going to go out of my way to heal you or to, to show you who Jesus is. I'm not going to go out of my way to tell you my testimony because I don't know you. You have to earn my trust first. Well, that's requiring some form of payment, is it not? Jesus had no relationship with us before he gave himself. Jesus didn't have our trust before he gave himself. Jesus required no payment from us, period, before he gave himself. That sounds like sacrifice, doesn't it? Man, so Jesus is saying, freely you, you've received, freely give. Go sacrifice yourself. Go make some sacrifices. Go be sacrificial with your time. Go be sacrificial with your energy. Go be sacrificial, you introverts, with your desire to stay home and not, say, not talk to anybody. <laughs> Go be sacrificial. Go give of yourself. This is, this is the picture of the person that Jesus has called us to be and is a picture of the person that he was. This is who we are to be, is it not? This is who we are to be in every way. So my question to you today is, what do you have that you've chosen to maintain rather than give? What do you have that you've chosen to hold on to that belongs to the person sitting next to you? What do you have that you haven't taken the time out of your day, your, your precious day, to give to somebody else. Because what we have been what has been poured into us is is designed to be poured out into other people. Amen. All right, stand with me and we'll pray. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.